Hello friends and welcome to the continuation in this calm reading of Little Women. Tonight I shall be reading for you chapter 25, The First Wedding, as well as chapter 26, Artistic Attempts. If you are new to the channel, I would encourage you to subscribe so you will be notified of upcoming readings. And now, let us find that calm place, that calm place where you can safely relax. Let us settle into that place. Take a deep breath. Unwind. And let us begin these chapters. Chapter 25 The First Wedding The June roses over the porch were awake bright and early on that morning, rejoicing with all their hearts in the cloudless sunshine, like friendly little neighbors as they were. Quite flushed with excitement were their ruddy faces, and as they swung in the wind, whispering to one another what they had seen, for some peeped in at the dining room windows where the feast was spread, some climbed up to nod and smile at the sisters as they dressed the bride, others waved a welcome to those who came and went on various errands in garden, porch, and hall, and all from the rosiest full-blown flower to the palest baby bud, offered the tribute of beauty and fragrance to the gentle mistress who had loved and tended them so long. Meg looked very like a rose herself, for all that was best and sweetest in heart and soul seemed to bloom into her face that day, making it fair and tender with a charm more beautiful than beauty. Neither silk, lace, nor orange flowers would she have. I don't want a fashionable wedding, but only those about me whom I love, and to them I wish to look and be my familiar self. So she made her wedding gown herself, sewing into it the tender hopes and innocent romances of a girlish heart. Her sisters braided up her pretty hair, and the only ornaments she wore were the lilies of the valley, which her John liked best of all the flowers that grew. You do look just like your own, dear Meg, only so very sweet and lovely that I should hug you if it wouldn't crumple your dress, cried Amy surveying her with delight when all was done. Then I am satisfied, but please hug and kiss me, everyone, and don't mind my dress. I want a great many crumples of this sort put into it today. And Meg opened her arms to her sisters, who clung about her with April faces, for a minute, feeling that the new love had not changed the old. Now I am going to tie John's cravat for him, and then to stay a few minutes with father quietly in the study. And Meg ran down to perform these little ceremonies, and then to follow her mother wherever she went, conscious that in spite of the smiles on the motherly face, there was a secret sorrow hidden in the motherly heart at the flight of the first bird from the nest. As the younger girls stand together, giving the last touches to their simple toilet, it may be a good time to tell of a few changes which three years have wrought in their appearance, for all are looking like the best just now. 
Joe's ankles are much softened. She has learned to carry herself with ease, if not grace. The curly crop has lengthened into a thick coil, more becoming to the small head, atop of the tall figure. There is a fresh color in her brown cheeks, a soft shine in her eyes, and only gentle words fall from her sharp tongue today. Beth has grown slender, pale, and more quiet than ever. The beautiful, kind eyes are larger, and in them lies an expression that saddens one, although it is not sad itself. It is the shadow of pain which touches the young face with such pathetic patience. But Beth seldom complains and always speaks hopefully of being better soon. Amy is with truth considered the flower of the family, for at sixteen she has the air and bearing of a full-grown woman, not beautiful, but possessed of that indescribable charm called Grace. One saw it in the lines of her figure, the make and motion of her hands, the flow of her dress, the droop of her hair, unconscious yet harmonious, and as attractive to many as beauty itself. Amy's nose still afflicted her, for it never would grow Grecian. So did her mouth, being too wide, and having a decided chin. These offending features gave character to her whole face, but she never could see it, and consoled herself with her wonderfully fair complexion, keen blue eyes, and curls more golden and abundant than ever. All three wore suits of thin silver grey, their best gowns for the summer, with blush roses in hair and bosom, and all three looked just what they were, fresh-faced, happy-hearted girls, pausing a moment in their busy lives to read with wistful eyes the sweetest chapter in the romance of womanhood. There were to be no ceremonious performances. Everything was to be as natural and homelike as possible. So, when Aunt March arrived, she was scandalized to see the bride come running to welcome and lead her in, to find the bridegroom fastening up a garland that had fallen down, and to catch a glimpse of the paternal minister marching upstairs with a grave countenance and a wine bottle under each arm. Upon my word, here's a state of things, cried the old lady, taking the seat of honor prepared for her, and settling the folds of her lavender moire with a great rustle. You oughtn't to be seen till last minute, child. I'm not a show, auntie, and no one is coming to stare at me, to criticize my dress, or count the cost of my luncheon. I'm too happy to care what anyone says or thinks, and I'm going to have my little wedding just as I like it. John dear, here's your hammer. And away went Meg to help that man in his highly improper employment. Mr. Brock didn't even say thank you, but as he stooped for the unromantic tool, he kissed his little bride behind the folding door, and with a look that made Aunt March whisk out her pocket handkerchief with a sudden dew in her sharp, old eyes. A crash, a cry, and a laugh from Lori, accompanied by the indecorous exclamation, Jupiter Ammon, Joe's upset the cake again, cast a momentary flurry, which was hardly over when a flock of cousins arrived, and the party came in, as Beth used to say when a child. Don't let that young giant come near me, he worries me worse than mosquitoes, whispered the old lady to Amy, as the rooms filled and Lori's black head towered above the rest. He has promised to be very good today, and he can be perfectly elegant if he likes, returned Amy 
and gliding away to warn Hercules to beware of the dragon, which warning caused him to haunt the old lady with a devotion that nearly distracted her. There was no bridal possession, but a sudden silence fell upon the room as Mr. March and the young couple took their places under the green arch. Mother and sisters gathered close, as if loath to give Meg up. The fatherly voice spoke more than once, which only seemed to make the service more beautiful and solemn. The bridegroom's hand trembled visibly, and no one heard his replies. But Meg looked straight up in her husband's eyes and said, I will with such tender trust in her own face and voice that her mother's heart rejoiced and Aunt March sniffed audibly. Jo did not cry, though she was very near it once, and was only saved from a demonstration by the consciousness that Lori was staring fixedly at her, with a comical mixture of merriment and emotion in his wicked black eyes. Beth, kept her face hidden on her mother's shoulder. But Amy stood like a graceful statue, with a most becoming ray of sunshine touching her white forehead, and the flower in her hair. It wasn't at all the thing, I'm afraid, but the minute she was fairly married, Meg cried. The first kiss for mommy, and, turning, gave it with her heart on her lips. During the next fifteen minutes she looked more like a rose than ever, for everyone availed themselves of the privileges to the fullest extent, from Mr. Lawrence to old Hannah, who, adorned with a headdress fearfully and wonderfully made, fell upon her in the hall, crying with a sob and a chuckle. Bless you, dearie, a hundred times. The cake ain't hurt a mite and everything looks lovely. Everybody cleared up after that, and said something brilliant, or tried to, which did just as well, for laughter is ready when hearts are light. There was no display of gifts, for they were already in the little house. Nor was there an elaborate breakfast, but a plentiful lunch of cake and fruit, dressed with flowers. Mr. Lawrence and Aunt March shrugged and smiled at one another when water, lemonade, and coffee were found to be the only sorts of nectar which the three heaps carried round. No one said anything, till Laurie, who insisted on serving the bride, appeared before her, with a loaded salver in his hand and puzzled expression on his face. Has Joe smashed all the bottles by accident? he whispered, or am I merely laboring under a delusion that I saw some lying about loose this morning? No, your grandfather kindly offered us his best, and Aunt Marge actually sent some. But father put away a little for Beth, and dispatched the rest to the soldier's home. You know he thinks that wine should be used only in illness, and mother says that neither she nor her daughters will ever offer it to any young man under her roof. Meg spoke seriously, and expected to see Laurie frown or laugh, but he did neither. For after a quick look at her, he said in his impetuous way, I like that, for I've seen enough harm done to wish other women would think as you do. You are not made wise by experience, I hope, and there was an anxious accent in Meg's voice. No, I give you my word for it. Don't think too well of me either. This is not one of my temptations. Being brought up where wine is as common as water, and almost as harmless, I don't care for it. But when a pretty girl offers it, one doesn't like to refuse, you see? But you will, for the sake of others, if not for your own. Come, Laurie, promise, and give me one more reason to call this the happiest day of my life. 
The demand, so sudden and so serious, made the young man hesitate a moment. For ridicule is often harder to bear than self-denial. Meg knew that if he gave the promise, he would keep it at all costs, and, feeling her power, used it as a woman may for her friend's good. She did not speak, but she looked up at him with a face made very eloquent by happiness, and a smile which said, No one can refuse me anything today. Lori certainly could not, and with an answering smile, he gave her his hand, saying heartily, I promise, Mrs. Brooke. I thank you very, very much. And I drink long life to your resolution, Teddy, cried Joe, baptizing him with a splash of lemonade, as she waved a glass and beamed approvingly upon him. So the toast was drunk, the pledge made, and loyalty kept in spite of many temptations. For, with instinctive wisdom, the girls seized a happy moment to do their friend a service, for which he thanked them all his life. After lunch, people strolled about, by twos and threes, through the house and garden, enjoying the sunshine without and within. Meg and John happened to be standing together in the middle of the grass plot, when Laurie was seized with an inspiration which put the finishing touch to this unfashionable wedding. All the married people take hands and dance round the new made husband and wife, as the Germans do, while we bachelors and spinsters prance in couples outside, cried Laurie, promenading down the path with Amy with such infectious spirit and skill that everyone else followed the example without a murmur. Mr. and Mrs. March, Aunt and Uncle Carol began it. Others rapidly joined in. Even Sally Moffat, after a moment's hesitation, threw her train over her arm and whisked Ned into the ring. But the crowning joke was Mr. Lawrence and Aunt March. For when the stately old gentleman just said solemnly up to the old lady, she just tucked her cane under her arm, and hopped briskly away to join hands with the rest and dance about the bridal pair, while the young folks pervaded the garden like butterflies on a midsummer day. Want of breath brought the impromptu ball to a close, and then people began to go. I wish you well, my dear, I heartily wish you well, but I think you'll be sorry for it, said Aunt March to Meg, adding to the bridegroom as he led her to the carriage. You've got a treasure, young man, see that you deserve it. That is the prettiest wedding I've been to for an age, Ned, and I don't see why for there wasn't a bit of style about it, observed Mrs. Moffat to her husband, as they drove away. Laurie, my lad, if you ever want to indulge in this sort of thing, get one of those little girls to help you, and I shall be perfectly satisfied, said Mr. Lawrence, settling himself in his easy chair to rest after the excitement of the morning. I'll do my best to gratify you, sir was Laurie's unusually dutiful reply, as he carefully unpinned the posy Joe had put in his buttonhole. The little house was not far away, and the only bridal journey Meg had was the quiet walk with John from the old home to the new. When she came down, looking like a pretty Quakeress in her dove-colored suit and straw bonnet tied with white, they all gathered about her to say goodbye, as tenderly as if she had been going to make the grand tour. Don't feel that I am separated from you, Marmy dear, or that I love you any less for loving John so much, she said, clinging to her mother with full eyes for a moment. I shall come every day, father, and expect to keep my old place in your hearts. 
though I am married. Beth is going to be with me a great deal, and the other girls will drop in now and then to laugh at my housekeeping struggles. Thank you all for my happy wedding day. Goodbye, goodbye. They stood watching her, with faces full of love and hope, and tender pride as she walked away, leaning on her husband's arm, with her hands full of flowers and the June sunshine brightening her happy face. And so Meg's married life began. Chapter 26 Artistic Attempts It takes people a long time to learn the difference between talent and genius, especially ambitious young men and women. Amy was learning this distinction through much tribulation. For mistaking enthusiasm for inspiration, she attempted every branch of art with youthful audacity. For a long time there was a lull in the mud pie business, and she devoted herself to the finest pen and ink drawing, in which she showed such taste and skill that her graceful handiwork proved both pleasant and profitable. But overstrained eyes caused pen and ink to be laid aside for a bold attempt at poker sketching. While this attack lasted, the family lived in constant fear of a conflagration. For the odor of burning wood pervaded the house at all hours. Smoke issued from attic and shed. With alarming frequency, red-hot popas lay about promiscuously, and Hannah never went to bed without a pail of water and a dinner bell at her door in case of fire. Raphael's face was found boldly executed on the underside of the molding board, and Bacchus on the head of a beer barrel. A chanting chirrup adorned the cover of the sugar bucket, and attempts to portray Romeo and Juliet supplied kindling for some time. From fire to oil was a natural transition for burnt fingers, and Amy fell to painting with undiminished ardor. An artist friend fitted her out with his cast of palettes, brushes, and colors, and she daubed away, producing pastoral and marine views, such as were never seen on land or sea. Her monstrosities in the way of cattle would have taken prizes at an agricultural fair, and the perilous pitching of her vessels would have produced seasickness in the most nautical observer. If the utter disregard to all known rules of shipbuilding and rigging had not convulsed him with laughter at the first glance. Swarthy boys and dark-eyed madonnas, staring at you from one corner of the studio, suggested Murillo, oily brown shadows of face, with a lurid streak in the wrong place, meant Rembrandt, buxom ladies and tropical infants Rubens, and Turner appeared in tempests of blue thunder, orange lightning, brown rain, and purple clouds, with a tomato-colored splash in the middle which might be the sun, or a buoy, a sailor's shirt, or a king's robe, as the spectator pleased. Charcoal portraits came next, and the entire family hung in a row, looking as wild and crocky as if just evoked from a coal bin. Softened into crayon sketches, they did better, for the likenesses were good, and Amy's hair, Joe's nose, Meg's mouth, and Lori's eyes were pronounced wonderfully fine. A return to clay and plaster followed, and ghostly casts of her acquaintances haunted corners of the house, or tumbled off closet shelves onto people's heads. Children were enticed in as models, till the incoherent accounts of her mysterious doings caused Miss Amy to be regarded in the light of a young ogress. Her efforts in this line, however, were brought to an abrupt close by an untoward accident, which quenched her ardor. 
Other models failing her for a time, she undertook to cast her own pretty foot, and the family were one day alarmed by an unearthly bumping and screaming and running to the rescue. Found a young enthusiast hopping wildly about the shed, with her foot held fast in a pan full of plaster, which had hardened with unexpected rapidity. With much difficulty and some danger she was dug out, for Joe was so overcome with laughter while she excavated that her knife went too far, cut the poor foot, and left a lasting memorial of one artistic attempt at least. After this Amy subsided, till a mania for sketching from nature set her to haunting river, field and wood, for picturesque studies, and sighing for ruins to copy. She caught endless colds, sitting on damp grass, to book a delicious spit, composed of a stone, a stump, one mushroom, and a broken mullein stalk, or a heavenly mass of clouds, that looked like a choice display of feather pets when done. She sacrificed her complexion floating on the river in the midsummer sun to study light and shade, and got a wrinkle over her nose trying after points of sight, or whatever the squint and string performance is called. If genius is eternal patience, as Michelangelo affirms, Amy had some claim to the divine attribute for she persevered in spite of all obstacles, failures, and discouragements, firmly believing that in time she should do something worthy to be called high art. She was learning, doing, and enjoying other things meanwhile, for she had resolved to be an attractive and accomplished woman, even if she never became a great artist. Here she succeeded better, for she was one of those happily created beings who please without effort, make friends everywhere, and take life so gracefully and easily that less fortunate souls are tempted to believe that such are born under a lucky star. Everybody liked her, for among her good gifts was tact. She had an instinctive sense of what was pleasing and proper, always said the right thing to the right person, did just what suited the time and place, and was so self-possessed that her sisters used to say, if Amy went to court without any rehearsal beforehand, she'd know exactly what to do. One of her weaknesses was a desire to move in our best society, without being quite sure what the best really was. Money, position, fashionable accomplishments, and elegant manners were most desirable things in her eyes, and she liked to associate with those who possessed them, often mistaking the false for the true, and admiring what was not admirable, never forgetting that by birth she was a gentlewoman. She cultivated her aristocratic tastes and feelings, so that when the opportunity came, she might be ready to take the place from which poverty now excluded her. My lady, as her friends called her, sincerely desired to be a genuine lady, and was so at heart, but had yet to learn that money cannot buy refinement of nature, that rank does not always confer nobility, and that true breeding makes itself felt in spite of external drawbacks. I want to ask a favor of you, Mama, Amy said, coming in with an important air one day. Well, little girl, what is it? replied her mother, in whose eyes the stately young lady still remained, the baby. Our drawing class breaks up next week. And before the girls separate for the summer, I want to ask them out here for a day. They are wild to see the river, sketch the broken bridge, and copy some of the things they admire in my book. They have been very kind to me in many ways, and I am grateful, for they are all rich and I know I am poor, yet they never made any difference. Why should they? 
and Mrs. Marge put the question with what the girls called her Maria Theresa air. You know as well as I that it does make a difference with nearly everyone, so don't ruffle up like a deer, motherly hen, when your chickens get packed by smarter birds. The ugly duckling turned out a swan, you know? And Amy smiled without bitterness, for she possessed a happy temper and hopeful spirit. Mrs. March laughed, and smoothed down her maternal pride as she asked, Well, my swan, what is your plan? I should like to ask the girls out to lunch next week, to take them for a drive to the places they want to see, a row on the river, perhaps, and make a little artistic fete for them. That looks feasible. What do you want for lunch? Cake, sandwiches, fruit and coffee will be all that is necessary, I suppose. Oh, dear, no. We must have cold tongue and chicken, French chocolate and ice cream besides. The girls are used to such things, and I want my lunch to be proper and elegant, though I do work for my living. How many young ladies are there? asked her mother, beginning to look sober. Twelve or fourteen in the class, but I dare say they won't all come. Bless me, child, you will have to charter an omnibus to carry them about. Why, mother, how can you think of such a thing? Not more than six or eight will probably come, so I shall hire a beach wagon and borrow Mr. Lawrence's cherry bounce. Hannah's pronunciation of Charabon. All of this will be expensive, Amy. Not very. I've calculated the cost, and I'll pay for it myself. Don't you think, dear, that as these girls are used to such things, and the best we can do will be nothing new? that some simpler plan would be pleasanter to them as a change, if not nothing more, and much better for us than buying or borrowing what we don't need, and attempting a style not in keeping with our circumstances. If I can't have it as I like, I don't care to have it at all. I know that I can carry it out perfectly well. If you and the girls will help a little, and I don't see why I can't, if I'm willing to pay for it said Amy, with the decision which opposition was apt to change into obstinacy. Mrs. March knew that experience was an excellent teacher, and when it was possible she left her children to learn alone the lessons which she would gladly have made easier if they had not objected to taking advice as much as they did salts and senna. Very well, Amy, if your heart is set upon it and you see your way through without too great an outlay of money, time, and temper. I'll say no more. Talk it over with the girls, and whichever way you decide, I'll do my best to help you. Thanks, mother. You are always so kind. And away went Amy to lay her plan before her sisters. Meg agreed at once, and promised her aid gladly offering anything she possessed, from her little house itself to her best salt spoons. But Joe frowned upon the whole project, and would have nothing to do with it at first. Why in the world should you spend your money, worry your family, and turn the house upside down for a parcel of girls, who don't care a sixpence for you? I thought you had too much pride and sense to truckle to any mortal woman just because she wears French boots and rides in a coupé, said Joe, who, being called from the tragic climax of a novel, was not in the best mood for social enterprises. I don't truckle, and I hate being patronized as much as you do, returned Amy indignantly for the two still jangled when such questions arose. The girls do care for me, and I for them, and there's a great deal of kindness and sense and talent among them, in spite of what you call fashionable nonsense. You don't care to make people like you, to go into good society and cultivate your manners and tastes. I do. 
and I mean to make the most of every chance that comes. You can go through the world with your elbows out and your nose in the air, and call it independence if you like. That's not my way. When Amy had wetted her tongue and freed her mind, she usually got the best of it, for she seldom failed to have common sense on her side. While Joe carried her love of liberty and hate of conventionalities to such an unlimited extent that she naturally found herself worsted in an argument. Amy's definition of Joe's idea of independence was such a good hit that both burst out laughing, and the discussion took a more amiable turn. Much against her will, Joe at length consented to sacrifice a day to Mrs. Grundy and help her sister through what she regarded as a nonsensical business. The invitations were sent, nearly all accepted, and the following Monday was set apart for the grand event. Hannah was out of humor because her week's work was deranged, and prophesied that if the washing and ironing weren't done regular, nothing would go well anywhere. This hitch in the mainspring of the domestic machinery had a bad effect upon the whole concern. But Amy's motto was nil desperandum, and having made up her mind what to do, she proceeded to do it in spite of all obstacles. To begin with, Hannah's cooking didn't turn out well. The chicken was tough, the tongue too salty, and the chocolate wouldn't froth properly. Then the cake and ice cost more than Amy expected. So did the wagon, and various other expenses, which seemed trifling at the outset, counted up rather alarmingly afterward. Beth got a cold and took to her bed. Meg had an unusual number of callers to keep at her home, and Joe was in such a divided state of mind that her breakages, accidents, and mistakes were uncommonly numerous, serious, and trying. If it was not fair on Monday, the young ladies were to come on Tuesday, an arrangement which aggravated Joe and Hannah to the last degree. On Monday morning, the weather was in that undecided state, which is more exasperating than a steady pour. It drizzled a little, shone a little, blew a little, and didn't make up its mind till it was too late for anyone else to make up theirs. Amy was up at dawn, hustling people out of their beds and through their breakfasts, that the house might be got in order. The parlor struck her as looking uncommonly shabby, but without stopping to sigh for what she had not. She skillfully made the best of what she had, arranging chairs over the worn places in the carpet, covering stains on the walls with homemade statuary, which gave an artistic air to the room, as did the lovely vases of flowers Joe scattered about. The lunch looked charming, and as she surveyed it, she sincerely hoped it would taste well, and that the borrowed glass, china, and silver would get safely home again. The carriages were promised. Meg and Mother were all ready to do the honors. Beth was able to help Hannah behind the scenes. Joe had engaged to be as lively and amiable as an absent mind, and aching head, and a very decided disapproval of everybody and everything would allow. And as she wearily dressed, Amy cheered herself with anticipations of the happy moment, when, lunch safely over, she should drive away with her friends, for an afternoon of artistic delights, for the cherry bounce and the broken bridge were her strong points. Then came the hour of suspense, during which she vibrated from parlor to porch, while public opinion varied like the weathercock. A smart shower at eleven had evidently quenched the enthusiasm of the young ladies, who were to arrive at twelve, four, nobody came, and at two the exhausted family sat down in a place of sunshine to consume their perishable portions 
of the feast, that nothing might get lost. No doubt about the weather today. They will certainly come, so we must fly around and be ready for them, said Amy as the sun woke her next morning. She spoke briskly, but in her secret soul she wished she had said nothing about Tuesday, for her interest, like her cake, was getting a little stale. I can't get any lobsters, so you will have to do without salad today, said Mr. March, coming in half an hour late, with an expression of placid despair. Use the chicken, then. The toughness won't matter in a salad, advised his wife. Hannah left it on the kitchen table a minute, and the kittens got at it. I'm very sorry, Amy, added Beth, who was still a patroness of cats. Then I must have a lobster, for tongue alone won't do, said Amy decidedly. Shall I rush into town and demand one? asked Joe, with the magnanimity of a martyr. You'd come bringing it home under your arm without any paper, just to try me. I'll go myself, answered Amy, whose temper was beginning to fail. Shrouded in a thick veil and armed with a genteel traveling basket, she departed, feeling that a cool drive would soothe her ruffled spirit and fit her for the labors of the day. After some delay, the object of desire was produced, likewise a bottle of dressing to prevent further loss of time at home, and off she drove again, well pleased with her own forethought. As the omnibus contained only one other passenger, a sleepy old lady, Amy pocketed her veil and beguiled the tedium of the way by trying to find out where all her money had gone to. So busy was she with her card, full of refractory figures, that she did not observe a newcomer who entered without stopping the vehicle, till a masculine voice said, Good morning, Miss Marge. And looking up, she beheld one of Laurie's most elegant college friends. Fervently hoping that he would get out before she did, Amy utterly ignored the basket at her feet, and congratulating herself that she had on her new travelling dress, returned to young men's greeting with her usual suavity and spirit. They got on excellently, for Amy's chief care was soon set at rest by learning that the gentleman would leave first and she was chatting away in a particularly lofty strain when the old lady got out. In stumbling to the door, she upset the basket, and, oh horror, the lobster in all its vulgar size and brilliancy was revealed to the high-born eyes of a Tudor. By Jove, she's forgotten her dinner, cried the unconscious youth, poking the scarlet monster into its place with his cane and preparing to hand out the basket after the old lady. Please don't, it's, it's mine, murmured Amy, with a face nearly as red as her fish. Oh, really, I beg your pardon. It's an uncommonly fine one, isn't it? said Tudor, with great presence of mind and an air of sober interest that did credit to his breeding. Amy recovered herself in a breath set her basket boldly on the seat, and said, laughing, Don't you wish you were to have some of the salad he's going to make, and to see the charming young ladies who are to eat it? Now, that was tact, for two of the ruling foibles of the masculine mind were touched. The lobster was instantly surrounded by a halo of pleasing reminiscences and curiosity about the charming young ladies diverted his mind from the comical mishap. I suppose he'll laugh and choke over it with Laurie, but I shan't see them. That's a comfort, thought Amy, as Tudor bowed and departed. She did not mention this meeting at home, though she discovered that, thanks to the upset, her new dress was much damaged by the rivulets of dressing that meandered down the skirt.
but went through with the preparations, which now seemed more irksome than before, and at twelve o'clock all was ready again, feeling that the neighbors were interested in her movements. She wished to efface the memory of yesterday's failure by a grand success to-day, so she ordered the cherry pounds, and drove away in state, to meet and escort her guests to the banquet. There's the rumble, they're coming. I'll go onto the porch and meet them. It looks hospitable, and I want the poor child to have a good time, after all her trouble, said Mrs. Marge, suiting the action to the word. But after one glance she retired, with an indescribable expression. For looking quite lost in the big carriage sat Amy and one young lady. Run, Beth, and help Hannah clear half the things off the table. It will be too absurd to put a luncheon for twelve before a single girl, cried Joe. Hurrying away to the lower regions, too excited to stop even for a laugh. In came Amy, quite calm and delightfully cordial, to the one guest who had kept her promise. The rest of the family, being of a dramatic turn, played their parts equally well and Miss Elliot found them a most hilarious set. For it was impossible to control entirely the merriment which possessed them, the remodeled lunch being gaily partaken of, the studio and garden visited, and art discussed with enthusiasm. Amy ordered a buggy, alas for the elegant cherry bounce, and drove her friend quietly about the neighborhood till sunset, when the party went out. As she came walking in, looking very tired but as composed as ever, she observed that every vestige of the unfortunate fete had disappeared, except a suspicious pucker about the corners of Joe's mouth. You've had a lovely afternoon for your drive, dear, said her mother, as respectfully as if the whole twelve had come. Miss Elliot is a very sweet girl, and seemed to enjoy herself, I thought, observed Beth, with unusual warmth. Could you spare me some of your cake? I really need some. I have so much company, and I can't make such delicious stuff as yours, asked Meg soberly. Take it all. I'm the only one here who likes sweet things, and it will mold before I can dispose of it, answered Amy, thinking with a sigh of the generous store she had laid in for such an end as this. It's a pity Laurie isn't here to help us, began Joe, as they sat down to ice cream and salad for the second time in two days. A warning look from her mother checked any further remarks, and the whole family ate in heroic silence, till Mr. March mildly observed. Salad was one of the favorite dishes of the ancients, and Evelyn, here a general explosion of laughter cut short the history of salads, to the great surprise of the learned gentleman. Bundle everything into a basket and send it to the Hummels, Germans like messes. I'm sick of the sight of this, and there's no reason you should all die of a surfeit, because I've been a fool, cried Amy wiping her eyes. I thought I should have died when I saw you two girls rattling about in the what-you-call-it, like two little kernels in a very big nutshell, and mother waiting in state to receive the throng, sighed Joe, quite spent with laughter. I'm very sorry you were disappointed, dear, but we all did our best to satisfy you, said Mrs. March in a tone full of motherly regret. I am satisfied. I've done what I undertook, and it's not my fault that I failed. I comfort myself with that, said Amy with a little quiver in her voice. I thank you all very much for helping me, and I'll thank you still more, if you won't allude to it for a month, at least. No one did for several months, but the word fet always produced a general smile and Laurie's birthday gift to Amy was a tiny coral lobster, 
in the shape of a charm for her watch guard.